I'm really hoping that maybe this is an educational opportunity for the general Alberta to learn about what these lines mean. Tonight, a proposed Alberta coal mine project in question. When I was growing up, my dad taught me this, and he said, if you can learn how to do this here, you'll never starve. And a Mi'kmaq community teaches traditional rabbit hunting. Good evening, welcome to APTN National News. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Bradley Barton took the stand this week in an Edmonton courtroom. Barton is being retried in the death of Cindy Gladue. Our Chris Stewart has the latest, a warning to viewers that this report contains graphic information. Earlier this week, Barton's attorney asked the jury not to make assumptions before hearing all of the evidence. And this is not a case of if you think Barton is a bad person. Barton testified that he paid Cindy Gladue for sex the first night they met at an Edmonton hotel. The following night, he told the judge and jury that after drinks, he and Cindy Gladue went to his room and once again had sex. He said that after performing a rough sex act, he discovered his fingers had blood on them. And he said he told Gladue he would not pay her as he assumed she was on her period. He says he washed up and went to sleep. And the next morning, he found Cindy Gladue's body in the bathroom. Under cross-examination, Barton admitted to lying dozens of times after her death, from when he called 911 to when he met Cindy and their interactions, and to an undercover officer in a police van while being transported to the remand center. Barton constantly said that he lied because he was confused and in shock. He also admitted he lied because he was afraid he would be charged. Barton's trial continues. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. Thanks, Chris. To Nova Scotia now, where the battle over treaty lobster harvesting rights has moved to the provincial courts. Shebaganagadi First Nation filed a class, uh, action, class action or a suit against the government of Nova Scotia. The action challenges a provincial regulation that states fish sold in Nova Scotia must be registered under a federal commercial license. The claim says this ignores treaty rights upheld by the Supreme Court of Canada in 1999 and is therefore unconstitutional. The, uh, last fall, Shbaganagadi launched their moderate livelihood fishery, which was met with violence from non-Indigenous fishermen who say the fishery is illegal. The province has 15 days to file notice of defence. A warming tent named for Raphael Andre, uh, an Inunaskapi man who died outside of a, shelter, a closed Montreal shelter two weeks ago, officially opened last night in Cabot Square, a downtown hub well known to the urban Indigenous population. Andre's death ignited calls for more overnight resources for the homeless. In a $25,000 donation from a Mohawk couple got the ball rolling, while members of the Innu Nation coordinated and sent intervention workers to Montreal to staff the warming tent overnight. The initial plan was to erect a traditional Innu chaputuan in the square, but organizer Michelle Audette said adding shelter in any form was their main concern. Le débat est important, mais il y a des vies, puis si on parle de minutes maintenant, là. il fait fret, ils ont faim, puis il faut que ça aille plus vite. Le reste, le débat va continuer, mais en ce moment, il y a plein de gens qui veulent aider, plein de gens à travers les nations, ici au Québec, qui sont prêts à aller à Montréal pour donner un coup de main aux gens qui sauvent des vies là-bas. There are developments on the COVID-19 vaccine front and the promise of more needles in more arms, but with a catch. Federal Procurement Minister Anita Anand says Canada stands to get more than 1 million additional doses of AstraZeneca's vaccine by the end of March. The issue is the vaccine is yet to be approved by Health Canada. The 1.1 million doses is on top of the 20 million the federal government has already ordered. There are fresh concerns today over the potential for the rapid spread of COVID-19 variants across Canada after two provinces said that they have identified cases. Saskatchewan announced on Tuesday it has discovered two UK variant infections, also known as B117, while New Brunswick says it's found three cases. New Brunswick's chief medical officer of health says the ease with which it can be transmitted is cause for alarm. 
it only takes one case to start an outbreak. I mean, of the old variant, every single outbreak that ever started was, was because of one case, and the case can lead to other outbreaks in other areas, long-term care facilities, which then affects healthcare workers, which then affects hospital services, which then can cause, you know, a zone to go to red and then go to lockdown. So it only takes one case to have those consequences. But the problem now with the variant is that each one of those cases that gets through all those barriers can then infect many, many more people very, very quickly. Meanwhile, in Alberta, the province is toughening quarantine rules around virus variants. The isolation period is being raised from 14 to 24 days in households where variants have been found. It comes as dozens of children and staff are isolating after four variant cases were linked to a daycare and two to schools in Calgary. Alberta's chief medical officer of health says none of the cases are linked to travel. We want to hear what you think. Do you have a COVID-related question that you want answered? Don't forget, we have a doctor on every Monday answering your questions about the virus, transmission, vaccines, variants, all of it. You can send your emails to news at aptn.ca. You can leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Leave your questions there. Uh, follow APTN News and join the conversation and see our latest stories. A bombshell report today by the Winnipeg Free Press has highlighted racism within the Winnipeg Fire Department. A paramedic complained two firefighters refused medical treatment to an Indigenous woman who had been stabbed in the throat last fall. The damning investigation has some calling for a closer, closer look at the toxic culture within the fire department and calling for the two firefighters involved to be fired. That's a story that we're working on for you. We'll have it for you tomorrow. We need to take a break right now, but when we come back, a new mine for an old fossil fuel is proposed for Southern Alberta. Now that this project has kind of moved itself along, um, you know, there's nation members, including myself, that are really concerned about it. A proposed coal mine project in southern Alberta could provide hundreds of jobs and bring in significant economic benefits, but some members of a nearby Indigenous community say that those benefits do not outweigh environmental impacts, and they're ur urgently working to educate their community before the project is approved. Tamara Pimentel has those details. The Blackfoot communities, Bigani and Kainai Nations, run along the eastern slope of the Rockies. This is near the proposed site for the Grassy Mountain coal mine. All Treaty 7 First Nations have written letters of support for the project, but Bigani members like Adam North Pagan are still working to educate residents with virtual meetings. Now that this project has kind of moved itself along, um, you know, there's nation members, including myself, that are really concerned about it. And, uh, you know, and I think it's time to kind of put the brakes on and kind of step back and kind of look at the, uh, you know, uh, look at the big picture. The project by Australian-owned Benga Mining is a proposed steel-making coal mine that will be developed on a previous mining area. It's projected to produce around 93 million tonnes of coal over its 23-year lifespan. It's supposed to provide hundreds of jobs and bring in economic benefits, but thousands, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, have formed groups in efforts to stop the mine to prevent environmental damage. This Facebook group has grown to have over 24,000 members. This is something that has not happened in Alberta. Um, we are always at odds. And so I'm really hoping that maybe this is an educational opportunity for the general Albertan to learn about what these lands mean. Latasha Kafrobe of the Kainai Nation created the Nitsitipi Water Protectors Group. She calls the mine an attack on tradition, culture, and livelihood. These mountains as a whole hold the stories of, of how our people came to be, how we, you know, came to steward and, and, um, and occupy these areas of land. There's so many things at risk here. When the Bigani Chief and Council wrote a letter of support for the mine in 2019, North Pagan says community members were left in the dark. We didn't really have too much uh, information on the, on the detail of the, uh, 
of the Grassy Mountain Coal Mining Project that's within our territory. Fast forward to 2021, Chief Stanley Greyer of Pikani reiterated his support in another statement. The only individuals that can and should speak on behalf of the Pikani Nation on all matters related to our lands is myself, the chief, along with my council. He also wrote, Pikani Nation fully endorses the Grassy Mountain Initiative. On Pikani, strong winds are always blowing. North Pagan says one major concern among residents is the toxins that could be blown into the community. Even though I'm all for economic benefits, but there's also a flip side to the coin. And we need to really balance that off with the, uh, you know, being able to protect the environment. APTN has reached out to Bigani Chief and Council for a comment. We are unable to reach them. The Grassy Mountain coal mine is currently being reviewed by provincial and federal regulators. If it's approved, construction for the project will begin in late 2021 with coal shipments in 2023. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Calgary. While many schools have been forced to conduct education using video conferencing, a Mi'kmaq community is in the classroom sharing traditional knowledge like how to, how to snare and skin a rabbit. A warning to viewers, this story has images of a dead bunny. Angel Moore brings us this. This is not a typical day in class for Fierce and White. This grade six student is learning firsthand traditional knowledge, like how to clean a rabbit, the Mi'kmaq way. Uh, felt kind of weird, but it's, it's I don't know, how, how Mi'kmaqs did it. People did it before. This is part of the Mi'kmaq language class at the Ilnu Sibuk Jina Muwogwom School in Sabaganagadi, First Nation. Educational assistant John Michael shares his teachings, such as how to cut the meat to prepare for rabbit stew. When I was growing up, my dad taught me this, and he said, if you can learn how to do this here, you'll never starve. And one of the things I, I remember, too, it teaches a lot. It teaches with, um, like with respect and how we're connected to uh, Mother Earth and all the stuff here. Traditional culture and identity are also part of the teachings. Instructor Greg Marr says this knowledge came far too close to being lost. So when different um, things like um, Indian Residential School came and um, you know colonization took place, it kind of displaced our traditional lands. So um, all of our culture and all of our traditions, they went underground and uh, a lot of them sacred teachings were lost. But now some of those teachings are in the classroom. A traditional snare was made to catch the rabbit, while an elder offered tobacco in thanks for the rabbit giving its life. To kind of close that gap of, um, you know, colonization. So we're looking for meaningful ways to decolonize um, our way of learning and to give back um, their teachings. For the next project, the students will learn how to make lobster traps to donate to the Mi'kmaq lobster harvesters. Angel Moore, APTN, National News, Chibuktuk, Halifax. Thanks, Angel. I had a rabbit for 14 years. That is not how he died. And we didn't eat him. Um, but you should, because they are delicious. Uh, time for another break, but when we come back, In Focus has compiled a massive list of new must-reads for kids and adults, all by Indigenous authors. Stay with us. This is the result of two years of hard work and I can't tell you how proud we are. Welcome back, it's time now for our photo of the day. Gail French captured this image of the city skyline of Detroit, Michigan, as seen from the shores of Windsor, Ontario. Thanks for this, Gail. You can keep those pictures coming by sending them to share at aptn.ca. Your photo might be our next photo of the day. Let's take a look now at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting off on the east coast, we've got cloud and three degrees for St. John's, four and snow for Halifax. La Grande River, minus six and sunny skies. Kujuak sunshine, minus 12. Shabugaboo, minus six and sunny. Saguenay, minus three and some snow. Minus one and uh, cloud for London. Sunshine and two for Toronto. 
Zero in snow for Capus Casing, zero in sunshine for Timmins. God's Lake, minus 16 in snow, minus 17 in snow for Doorway House. Minus three in snow for Winnipeg, sunshine, minus five in Brannon. 11 and minus 11 and sunny for Swift Current, minus 18 in sunshine for Saskatoon. Minus 16 in snow for La Rage, minus 22 in snow for Stony Rapids. Minus 24 and snow for Fort Chip, minus 20 in snow for Grand Prairie. Minus 10 in snow for Edmonton, sunshine and three for Lethbridge. Kamloops two and snow Quinell zero and some flurries expected there. Prince Rupert rain and five degrees, Dees Lake minus eight in sunshine. Minus 18 and sunny for White Horse, Beaver Creek minus 25 and sunny. Wrigley minus 31 in sunshine, Trout Lake minus 25 and sunny, same with Fort Leard. Clear and minus 34 degrees for Saks Harbor, minus 38 in Fort McPherson, clear skies. Chesterfield and New Yacht and Whale Cove, all sunshine, minus 31. Clyde River, minus uh, 28, and Snow, Pangertongue Snow, and minus 14. Well, many of us have basically finished Netflix during this pandemic, and it's time to fill our brains the old-fashioned way. On In Focus today, we compiled a massive list of new must-reads for you, including a chat with Nicole McLaren, who started a company called Raven Reads, which delivers curated book boxes right to your door. Raven Reads really came out of a personal desire to play a role in this reconciliation movement. Um, I started a book club at work in 2016 to focus exclusively on authors by, uh, by Indigenous authors. Um, as we went through the book club, I discovered how much of an impact these books were having on my coworkers, both mm -hmm. in discovering new authors that they had never even heard of. Mm -hmm. And it also helped them really make a connection between contemporary societal issues that we saw as well as uh, with our his history in Canada. Uh, so I thought, what a great way to put a bridge between, uh, you know, these great books mm -hmm. and create a bridge of empathy between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians. That's that's a really important book because Ron Derrickson, Grand Chief Ron Derrickson, uh, you know, he's been a chief of the West Bank for uh, many years, but he's also, um, you know, been a successful businessman. Uh, I don't know. Uh, he's certainly a millionaire, if not more. Mm -hmm. And uh, this book is about his uh, life struggle, dealing with the racism in, you know, the Okanagan Valley and the struggles he had to go through, and not only as a chief and a leader, mm -hmm. but, you know, he was physically attacked because he was uh, trying to bring rules in for, you know, trailer parks that were leaseholders on the reserve and that. And, mm -hmm. They hired an assassin to get rid of him, and you know the guy showed up at his door wow. with a sword to try and kill him. That's that story is in the book. So the book is a very interesting book, talking about um, you know how Grand Chief Ron Derrickson um, you know struggled to get our rights uh, recognized and dealing with the racism of the governments mm -hmm. and of non-natives in, in the world of business. Uh, he also went to Ukraine and started businesses in the Ukraine, so he's got international business experience. But the book's very fascinating because many of our people, you know, haven't been successful in, yes. in the business world. So Ron is an exception, and everybody should read his life story because, uh, you know, he has a lot to tell about, you know, what he's seen and been through. And now we've been working for, you know, the past 10 months to gather these women's stories, mm -hmm. and so we could put them out out there in this book. It was really amazing. It really, um, it connected me to these women. Some of them I knew, some of them I didn't. Um, and it really made me proud to be a Métis woman because I think so often Métis women's stories are maybe hidden in the shadows. A lot of the history is told from the side of the men. Mm -hmm. And so it really showed me that every Métis woman has a very individual, unique story, but there are these common connections that bring us all together. And I was really able to see that while going through and like putting it all together. Still on the topic of books, for the first time, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, The Itsy Bitsy Spider, and You Are My Sunshine were translated into the Mohawk language and published as baby books for children in Ganawage and beyond. Here's another look at a story that we brought to you by, uh, was brought to you by Lindsay Richardson. An old tune sung in an even older language. 
It's the itsy bitsy spider, sung in the Mohawk language of Gunyageha, one book in a series of three now available to children in Ganawage, thanks to a local publishing house. This is the result of two years of hard work and I can't tell you how proud we are. Odisto, Odisto, also available, Odisto, Odisto, or Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, and Agerakwa, You Are My Sunshine, all illustrated by local artists. Using a makeshift drive through system to respect COVID-19 guidelines, the books were handed out for free to parents and their babies. It's, it's really nice. A lot of them are in the cars and seeing their faces light up and we hand it to them and knowing that it's something that they can manipulate and handle themselves. Yorun Yahawi McComer is a coordinator at the Ganawage Language Nest, an immersion space where mothers and children converse only in Ganyageha. Mohawk nursery rhymes used to be sung aloud and were never committed to writing until now. You have to get the tune in mind and our words are so much longer than the English so we have to make the words fit into a tune that is sung with English words. Um, so that's a process in itself. A bright shiny star In heaven. Katari Deer didn't have books like these as a young girl. When we were going to school, we weren't allowed to talk our language. If we spoke it, they, you got scolded. As an adult, she'd go on to teach it. It welcomed us. Maybe the sky and the stars. One of the books is now dedicated to her. Deer says her parents when sustained the language at home, at home despite we pressure in English. school. The first thing my mom said to us, I don't care what kind of language you learn today. In this house we speak Mohawk. Because if I don't understand what you're saying, you ain't getting what you want. <laughs> With fewer than 3,500 speakers left, the Mohawk language is considered endangered, though more tools exist now than ever. There are first language children shows like Dota de Nanaguari and study guides published in the weekly paper. I don't want to get emotional. <laughs> but speaking but about the baby books, project coordinator Jody Jacobs says she wanted to share the language the way a once beloved teacher did, through song. I just thought that my grandchildren should learn that way as well. They may be three small cardboard books, but together they're marking a new chapter in Mohawk language revitalization. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Ganawage, Mohawk Territory. We will share that whole list that we compiled for in focus on our website, so stay tuned for that. So many incredible reads out there this year to get us through the winter and beyond. We've got books to watch out for this spring and this fall too. Well, we are all out of time. Thank you for joining us. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Have a great night.